Uh, welcome back at the uh, closing ceremony of the Next Generation Podium. Um, we are now here um, together with you and we are uh, hoping to see all your results from all teams. And we have also a jury uh, present here. Um, first, I want to introduce, introduce you to uh, Eric Pasveer. He is director of um, uh, strategy of the city of Amsterdam, uh, founding father of the Shore Eurodelta Network. And Amsterdam is currently the secretariat of the Shore Eurodelta Network. Um, Eric uh, and Anakita, maybe you can, yes. We will be uh, co-moderating uh, this uh, closing ceremony. Um, furthermore, there will be uh, uh, a, few, a few, uh, uh, few members. Uh, if I have it right, um, uh, it is uh, maybe, maybe uh, Eric can also say uh, um, something about it. Um, but Robert uh, Kalka, uh, David Martens, Marie Ekateler Hanna, and Carola Hein will be uh, doing a closing statement uh, later on. Um, Hello, everyone. Robert Kalka is project manager of the uh, Federal Office for Building and Regional Planning uh, in Germany. Uh, David Martens is uh, a designer and generalist uh, based in Brussels, currently supporting the team at the new European Bauhaus, uh, while wondering how to be a socially committed designer in the neoliberal age. David is uh, building a practice of making openings. And Mary uh, Dekler-Hanna is Inspector General at the Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition. Uh, and Carola Hein, um, last but not least, uh, she is a Professor History of Architecture, Heritage, Urban Studies and Urban Development from Leiden University, TU Delft, and Erasmus University, Rotterdam. And she's also a professor at the combination of three universities, Leiden, Delft, Erasmus, and uh, on the subject of uh, history of architecture, heritage, urban studies, and urban development. Uh, since the beginning of 2022, she has held the UNESCO chair in water, ports, and historic cities. Uh, welcome everyone, uh, also the jury members, and uh, especially our founding father of the Shure Network, also uh, Eric Pasveer. And um, uh, I have one minute more, but uh, I think we are just so curious about uh, all the, the pitches. I would like to uh, invite uh, the uh, first uh, team, that will be team uh, one. So. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I will be presenting the team. I can share my screen. Very nice, Pavitra. Pavitra, yeah. Um, can you all see my screen and hear me as well? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I will start. Uh, we're part, our team is part of the water management and climate adaptation. Our um, research topic was from a blue corridor to an interconnected network, North Sea Ports uh, Cross Alliance. We started um, talking about our research team and how uh, all of us are based around um, the portal zones as well, and we have a greater understanding of it and um, since the portal zones are quite next to the water uh, uh, areas we thought we'd uh, deep dive into it and look at like the local context and uh, we fell upon Antwerp as it is the second largest port in Europe and it is a circular economy with uh, different strategies. Um, then we looked at our idea in three different scales. So we went from the city scale to the regional scale to the multi-regional uh, scale. Um, the port zones in the Euro Delta region are at most vulnerable positions with the unavoidable existence of climate change and its high flood risks. Yet they are at the best position economically, 
With water being the common denominator, it's time for a collaborative approach for these zones between the countries in this mega region and proposed future strategies. Divided between vertical, the intangible system and horizontal, horizontal tangible system, we start at the local scale of Antwerp. Um, we looked at the three different aspects. So there's the economy, eco uh, ecology and society in order to have sustainable interventions. Uh, we here we have a collage image of at the regional scale. So we have a cross border cooperation between core ports with a leading strategy of joint uh, coastal prevention and changing landscapes caused by the impending uh, climate change. Here we can see both two ports uh, that's right next to each other, Antwerp and Rotterdam, which are both the largest ports in Europe. So we started looking at our different scales from, uh, so our regional scale goes from these two ports and the connectivity between them. Um, in order to upscale and impact, we have to actually first try from our uh, local scale. Uh, it must have worked and these results must be in a tangible scale. So we move forward uh, according to that. It has to be an intergovernmental and transnational communication between the different ports. And there has to be a um, force uh, port, ports cross alliance. Um, there's a two different strategies, which uh, is between the sea ports on the North Sea coastline, and then we move for uh, move inwards towards the in, inland waterways. Um, this is the vision of 2050. So transforming the corridor to a network. This is uh, the connection between the uh, uh, sea ports um, zones, and then we move slowly towards the inland uh, waterways. And then vision 2070 is balancing the network. So through our vertical system, which is the intangible system, we suggest a, a technological uh, update. We realize that, that, that there, is a, um, there, there isn't much of a technological advancement in the port uh, industrial zones. And this is how we get our vertical systems going through. And we, have, uh, share, we share our knowledge and information between the different ports. And um, that's how we create this balancing network between the two, two different uh, um, strategies. So here's our timeline uh, from 2022 to 2070. 2022, uh, we're taking actions at a local scale. We're testing out different uh, methods and strategies. Then we go to 2050, transforming a corridor to a network. And then 2070, we have the primary ports uh, empowering the secondary ones. And here's our final image, uh, just a satellite view of our North Sea ports cross alliance. As you can see, we've highlighted all of the portal zones and um, how we are um, uh, uh, dealing with the climate change and the flood risk. We can, the green areas show the buffer zones for the increasing uh, sea level rise. And uh, yeah, we go from a blue corridor to an interconnected network between all of them. Thank you. Wow, Pafitra, very nice to, uh, to see this uh, pitch. Thank you very much for the first Thank one. Um, we will react uh, with the jury uh, later on uh, sure. when you can share on share the screen. Yes, thank you. We will continue with uh, team six. Uh, please uh, come forward from team six. Yeah, I, uh, so I share the screen. Yes, um, you can start. Yeah, hi. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon. This, uh, we're group six. This is the project uh, Living Delta, the many capillaries. We refer to the project as these many capillaries as a conceptual interpretation of the region as a living organism and how to create these better connections as uh, uh, to create uh, a, better, a better region. So first we focused on questioning what were the problems uh, with the mobility in, in patterns of, of the urban growth at the local scale. Um, and then we started to thought, uh, what was the best way to tackle these issues? So um, the way that we thought about is to create a better and faster way to connect the secondary cities. Uh, with secondary cities, uh, we refer to those cities that have the infrastructure, but don't have the a high-speed rail system to connect with each other. 
Um, we started focusing on this uh, example of Ghent and Antwerp uh, because there's a slow line that connects seven different cities in between, but there is no direct uh, high-speed rail uh, in between those cities. So uh, by improving these connections of the secondary cities, we try to prevent the urban sprawl along the railway systems and creating cities that won't depend on cars and we leave a space for healthier and natural environments in between the spaces. Yeah, so in order to proceed further, first we realized that we need to an interface where we can consolidate the existing data and also uh, uh, combine it with the future proposals. And then we propose an app that is actually an interface where all the modes of transportation are combined. Uh, and also this app also combines uh, the uh, ticketing system, a combined ticketing, ticketing system that can work throughout the delta of uh, your delta and one can move from one point to another with extreme ease. Uh, in order to uh, further progress, we actually phased down our project. And after the very local Genta and Perp phase, we moved to phase two, where we are connecting primary, secondary street, uh, cities, and then further to enhance this on the larger scale we uh, propose the connection uh, the, to in increase the length of this connection to uh, beyond the borders and connect uh, 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 France, uh, Amsterdam, uh, Germany, uh, uh, UK, as well as France uh, together and make, a, make this region really one uh, uni region. And in the image below, we see uh, very strongly how these different modes of transportation combine with each other. So we have existing railways we see in the corner, but we superimpose it uh, with a, a high-speed rail system that connects between the two uh, major cities uh, with a lesser commuting time and also a smaller commuting system in uh, maybe in form of pods, a pod system that actually connects and forms a web of uh, secondary cities and connect them to primary ones as well. And uh, after achieving this, we try to uh, locate few uh, points uh, where we can have a uh, restrict the growth of the city and uh, uh, restrict the urban sprawling of the cities and hence utilize this opportunity to create public spaces which can be used for biking or uh, recreational activities, hence creating an opportunity for a circular economy as well as having uh, these goals in uh, place that we wanted to have a system where cross-border share uh, sharing of resources possible. So yeah, that's the idea we propose. Um, as uh, forming one big system of uh, Euro Delta, which is beyond the boundaries and uh, which is living as well as functioning and always growing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Said and Victor. Um, Eric, um, how can you respond on this? Uh, and uh, the, the following will be uh, team, uh, I have to see nine. Please team nine, come forward. And Eric? Yes. Well, let, let's let's start with team team nine. But I the first two presentations were already uh, very special, very good. So I'm curious. Uh, uh, Matab, can you show the screen, please? Hi, and uh, can you see this? Yes. Okay. Uh, we started talking about uh, thinking about this cross-border movement in uh, different areas of this region. And then uh, we focused uh, on this area, these uh, three cities, Masrich, Aachen, and Liege, because they were so close together and uh, they had this close relationship together. and. Uh, for the, uh, we started with the movement concept of concept of movement <coughs> in the border, but then uh, we uh, try to focus mostly on universities and innovation centers in this area, and uh, how they can, uh, you know, contribute to a bigger network. And uh, we uh, found some information that uh, Liège University, Maastricht, and Aachen are uh, already connected and have this academic relationship together. Uh, but we also thought that, okay, uh, we can strengthen this uh, connection and we can also involve innovation centers and industry directly to the 
uh, to university and academic research. Uh, so we uh, thought of a, a platform, a kind of platform that uh, can, uh, you know, universities uh, somehow uh, share uh, what they are doing and their research and their project. And also uh, uh, innovation centers can, uh, you know, can be informed and uh, take a look at them and be involved in it. And uh, they can be in, in contact directly and uh, also entrepreneurs and industry. Uh, and also we thought that, okay, if uh, we have this uh, platform, so uh, we can have some parts of the campus and university as a, as a public uh, area that all these, uh, you know, uh, industries, entrepreneurs, innovation centers and academic uh, researchers can uh, meet each other and uh, have this direct relation. So somehow we're gonna have this, uh, sorry. We're gonna have uh, this connection that is in the whole area and beyond, uh, because everybody and all the you know entrepreneurs from other parts of the region also can be connected to the uh, to these uh, innovative centers and uh, academic research. Yeah, and so also uh, just to complete a bit what uh, you said. Um, the, the main idea is also, as we identified when uh, while studying a bit these uh, relations, uh, relations between these three cities and while we were trying to understand these specific movements through uh, the borders between the three countries, uh, we identified um, through the University of Aachen uh, with the presence of university but also innovation centers uh, companies and enterprises that are working on the specific technological uh, uh, fields of a high level uh, that there was still as often in Europe with the metropolisations uh, effect this uh, will to concentrate a lot of uh, activities and innovations uh, in the same city so through these uh, strategies, it was the idea also to propose a diverse uh, vision of the uh, territory. And as uh, here in the, this uh, specific region, there is uh, uh, this opportunity of um, um, enjoying already a really good network of transport systems and uh, urban fabric uh, environments that are able to um, welcome such uh, uh, activities and um, um, uh, education systems also through the university uh, without that it uh, would be interesting to uh, um, to involve the wider range of um, of uh, cities and urban uh, centers uh, within uh, within uh, this process and at the same time as, as uh, said Matab with the, this idea of uh, developing like a kind of strategic um, settlements uh, that could be based around um, the um, stations or nodes of transportation systems uh, to uh, enjoy the connectiveness that is already present, but at the same time uh, developing activities on the less developed uh, cities and territories. Um, reach at the same time, uh, also um, goals from the SDG, um, some of the objectives about sustainability, uh, less uh, movements, less uh, transportation system that could be a, a source of um, pollution, uh, inclusion also promotes uh, an inclusion uh, vision of the territory. Um, and so uh, without here in the specific case that having already this collaboration of uh, the th these three universities from these three cities, uh, it could be a, a network to, to be used and a starting point to, to um, create this kind of um, larger um, um, regional collaboration in, by involving other, other stakeholders and other actors. And then with these specific um, visions, we thought that it could be uh, replicable uh, for other um, other fields. So here we start with uh, universities, so knowledge, but it can be implemented for technologies, innovations, uh, enterprises that are working in technologies, as is it the case in uh, Aiken. And um, we thought that this could be replicable also in other 
of the um, places of the this um, um, urban uh, urban region. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you can unshare the screen, and we will uh, go uh, uh, further with the jury, uh, Eric. Um, so I, we, we were all very, very curious. So we made a, a quick start with the first presentations. Um, uh, but this allows me to, to uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about the context of the, the, the final, this final part of our uh, Next Generation podium. Um, again, the, uh, the, the jury, um, Rupert, Marie and, and David will reflect on the, the presentations uh, when they're finished, but I think it's it's fair if there are uh, urgent questions, uh, some extra information is needed that, that the, the members of the jury just raise their hands and, and ask the question just to have a bit better understanding of the, the presentations. And we started with um, uh, the first set. Uh, the, the, we, we, we combined uh, groups of students from with different themes in one set uh, to make sure that um, we have a, a fast round of presentations, um, and I'm I'm already very very delighted by what I see. We uh, will go. We have half an hour for each set, so we have a few minutes for maybe some first questions or remarks from the members of the jury. And let me remind you, we don't have a jury to have to raise a verdict, so there will be no winners or losers. In the end, we will all be be winners. We're very happy with all the work that has been done, but it's interesting to to present your your works, your insights to a to a professional board of of uh, uh, of, of jury members to to reflect on your work. So maybe one or two remarks by the by the jury members already. How you feel about this? The ah, Marie, please. Um, hello, everybody, and. Thank you, thank you very much for the organization of this jury and already, uh, as Eric said, uh, congratulations to, to the, the, the three teams we, we could see. Uh, maybe just a brief uh, reaction at, at, at this stage. Uh, I think it's really first uh, who I'm so, as, uh, as it said, I'm from French. Uh, Ministry for Ecological Transition and uh, uh, but, um, work um, both on the government and state and for local authorities, mainly in the, in the issues of, uh, of uh, territorial development. So what I find extremely interesting and necessary is that all of you are the, the SDGs and uh, sustainable development in mind. Uh, this is, a, I think, a very strong point because uh, in real life, if I can say so, we very often see uh, very um, projects very interesting from an economic point of view or environmental point of view or social point of view, but they don't join. So congratulations for on this you, you have in common. Um, maybe um, maybe a, a second thing in, uh, uh, about the, 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 but it's more into details for 14 one. So at this stage, I remain there and then I have other questions, but later on, thank you. Okay. So maybe you, Rupert or David, and I just this is also an opportunity to uh, shortly introduce yourself to, to, uh, to the students. Okay. I will start. So first of all, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to be here. Would be of course nicer to be to meet in reality, and uh, the discussions would be much um, greater. But I cherish it very much that you you chose me. It's really an honor for me. Uh, well, I'm I'm um, head of a division of regional development, so I'm not in the urban field. I'm more in the regional field. And um, I'm, I'm very much impressed um, about uh, your, your um, creativity. And um, let me ask you, how, how much time did you have to, to uh, develop these ideas? Any of the students? And I, I know the answer, but... Uh, like eight please. hours? Uh, pardon? It was like eight hours. Okay, great. <laughs> well, this is, this is really a, a great job. Um, great creativity, great uh, visualizations, and... Uh, great visions, um, of, of course. And uh, so I know that um, uh, I cannot expect 
everything. But uh, I come a little bit, I work very closely with the Ministry of Interior in, in, in Germany, or now the Ministry of, of, of Construction. And um, they will ask me, of course, always so uh, good ideas, how to bring it into reality and how to make it um, uh, real and, and, and concrete. And, and this week I had uh, nine job interviews, so <laughs> maybe I'm a little bit uh, nasty in, in asking uh, critical questions. But um, this does, uh, is not, uh, the, uh, does not mean that I, I don't like uh, your ideas. For me, of course, one question is um, how to um, bring uh, those actors together, especially if these are very long time uh, visions. And um, what about the empirical uh, basis? Is, for example, transport in 20 or 30 years um, so more important? What about the, the prognosis? Or is it uh, more on a, on, on a virtual um, uh, networking? Um, so data also um, and, um, with regard, how many minutes do I have? Please interrupt. Just me. just, just one, one or two minutes. To, okay. Uh, first yeah. question, we will have at the end of the, all the presentations plenty of time to okay. get okay. more into detail yeah. uh, questioning. Yes. Okay, so maybe i just uh, give you some, some keywords, actors, networking, which persons are necessary also in the, in the short and in the long run. Um, what about the empirical basis uh, for, for visions? how to get the, the commitment also uh, in, in the long run, because people like me, I will leave my job in 15 years and, and others um, too, there are um, others. And of course, what kind of projects do you need afterwards and which, which funding do you need for the projects to bring uh, your visions into, into action? Short-term projects, medium-term, but also long-term uh, okay. projects. Here I will stop. Just one, one or two Quick, quick reactions after we uh, have given David the opportunity to present himself as member of the jury. And maybe also add one or two questions to the students. Hey, everyone. I don't know, I, in my Zoom, like the stage is constantly shifting. So I'm not sure if you can see me, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that, I'm, that I'm, I can be here with you. It's true that of course, jury sounds a bit heavy. I mean, we're all, in a process just like you are i'm working with the new european bows and even though um this team working the commission we're also just inside a process and um yeah i agree very much with um what rupert was saying before and i, th I don't i'm not sure if this is already the moment to, to really uh get into those things i've also, I made loads of notes about both both of the three te um, teams. What I find especially astounding is like this region. I'm from uh, Leuven originally. I know very well. I've taken loads of trains, visited loads of times the different cities, also the universities, um, both in Maastricht, Liège. Um, I just went sailing in the Delta region last weekend. Um, I have family in Ghent in Antwerp. So. I find it pretty fascinating to see, like, I, I'm not sure if you're all from the region, um, but yeah, to see to see people working on this context, which I can I actually call my home um, by you also in the English language, which is probably um, none of our first languages. Yes, that's just uh, some, some first remarks from my side. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, one or two minutes at the first reaction from the, from the, from the teams. And then we go on to the next set of presentations. Perhaps the, the, the first team or the second team that was working on the rails. Yes, please say it. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Shor symposium for giving us this opportunity because uh, it's really great to work with such a uh, interdisciplinary uh, team and have your ideas uh, 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 like concentrated and finalizing them because of course because all of us have very different perspective of thinking and it's really great how we can manage to come up to one conclusion uh, which is agreeable to most and uh, yeah, uh, I would say I have really learned a lot from this exposure and uh, it's a great opportunity, but I still feel that the exercise part could have been a little longer. I had said this mm -hmm. earlier also, because 
it gives us an opportunity to think on the uh, deeper insights because right now we are still hovering on pretty superficial uh, parameters i would say not so much in depth okay yeah yeah, yeah. I agree with that. So um, let's let's move on to the next set of presentations. Uh, and according to my schedule, then it's time to there we go. Invite Team Two Seven Eleven in this order to uh, present their their work. Team Two. Uh, I, I'll be presenting for uh, Team Two. Team Two already did. Uh, yeah, we've got the slides here. Uh, so I was part of team two with uh, Karine Weiss, Celine Menov, and uh, Tonga uh, Malakovic, and we suggested a magic June for the uh, town of Ustenda in uh, Belgium, uh, which we'll have a look at in the next slide. Uh, yeah, so Ustenda is this town that falls in the Euro Delta, naturally, of course, being in Belgium. Uh, it's a low-lying coastal town with a strong tourist industry and history support. Um, it also has an issue with uh, sea defences, so it'll help us in our uh, proposal going forward into the next slide where we've got a few pictures of the town just to better establish context on the next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, you can see aspects of it here. Uh, it's a, uh, a low-lying town on the coast, uh, you'll see on our next slide here. Uh, um, there's a real risk of uh, sea level rise. Uh, we have two maps on the next slide uh, displaying this uh, the two hypothetical scenarios where sea level rise to rise by a meter and six meter or six meter. and while these are extreme outcomes uh, it just goes to illustrate that the threat which the city falls under um, so what is our solution to this well that's present in the next slide uh, which is the establishment of a magic june which is effectively a dike which serves a multiple purpose and we propose that this dike uh, would operate as a uh, not only is purely a flood defense infrastructure but would actually operate as not just an answer to the challenge of water management but also as an opportunity to uh, achieve these other goals so we would have the dike serve as a public garage an elevated bikeway tension elevated motorway as a multi uh, multi-modal uh, transfer hook um so it would solve a lot of existing problems in the city before even solving the problem of um, uh, water management. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so in coming up with this idea, we drew inspiration from the following images on the next slide uh, here that were suggested to us by Thomas, who uh, supervised us in part, but also from ourselves. We just really took inspiration from the innovation in their approach to climate defense. And also, actually, I forgot to mention in the previous slide, the uh, level of um, green infrastructure we would incorporate into this, and that's present in the image on the uh, top right. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we'll see how we perfect this idea out to Euro Delta. So of course, on a side scale, it's just an Ostend, but uh, we're to be successful, it could expand beyond Belgium and into the mega regional scale. And that's the unique thing about uh, water management, with the exception of islands, uh, it really is always a transboundary issue. And ultimately, if this idea were to prove a success, we could transplant it into these other uh, locations where ultimately water management will prove a pressing issue. Um, and then next, we will discuss um, the benefits of this. Uh, so, the benefits that water, uh, that the uh, like or Magic June, as we've net dubbed it. Uh, we'll propose in the next slide here. Um, so yeah, it would offer, it would save space for housing, but it would also create space for transport. Uh, it would you know, save existing land uh, from the threats of sea level rise uh, and extreme weather events, which would be more common to climate change. Uh, and it'll be designed with nature in mind. Uh, so while the main advantage is a greater resilience to flooding at the mega regional scale, it would also offer benefits uh, elsewhere, and especially in Ustand, which is quite an old town with low infrastructure, the um, the uh, proposed uh, Magic June will offer uh, will boost the transport infrastructure of the area and the green infrastructure of the area, which are currently kind of lacking, while also solving this other problem. Uh, and then in the next slide, 
uh, we discussed the implementation of process uh, who were involving. So obviously involved national government and, uh, and we've been consultation with stakeholders in the area as to how we can tailor this project to best suit them. Um, you know, so to the extent, yeah, the governments, governments involved with the extent municipality, the province of West Flanders, uh, but then the stakeholders are the private sectors, local citizens, businesses, uh, other things, and we'll hope to achieve funding from investment banks, adaptation funds, and all of the goods. So ultimately, we start to propose and develop the project in this year, we to do so. And then hopefully construction will start within the next decade and will be completed by that, the end of it as well. Um, and then you could reflect on the success and weigh up our options with regards to further um, expansion of the idea and proliferation throughout the uh, region. Uh, in our penultimate slide here, uh, before our references, we'll just have a look at a little map of what it could be and the real core benefits of this project being, you know, mobility, quick space, biodiversity, relaxation, and that pleasure after. Of course, the inherent protection against uh, the inherent benefit of water management. And then finally, we'll just conclude with our references, which we can just um, make the presentation on the final slide. Uh, yeah. So that's our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, any points that you'd like to add from the, from the, the other? members of the group. This was the presentation. I thought it was great. We, we had a little trouble at that. I had a little a problem Tom, understanding, hearing what you said that there was some. Uh, um, I'm sorry, my connection has been a bit funny. Yeah, yeah, the but uh, the, 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 the images, the presentation was very, very clear. So I think everybody understood. Um, so let's move on to the next presentation. Um, and just to, to outline this to, to the whole audience, uh, we're doing that in in uh, working have been working in twelve teams of an average of seven uh, students. So that would be something between eighty, a little bit more uh, uh, students have, have been working in the past day and a half on on complex issues, and they all uh, were working on three teams: uh, climate adaptation, smart specialization, and cross border uh, transportation. Um, and I would like to invite uh, the next team, Team 7, to present their results. Yeah, of Please course. go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, also thank you for this uh, nice week. Um, I had a lot of input and it was also fun working together. Um, so our project, we called it the Mobility of Choice. And we wanted to create a dense network, um, a mega, uh, mega regional network and a borderless network of uh, different kinds of mobility. And we also focused on the current situation that, uh, for example, if you go nowadays from Cologne to Brussels, uh, you have a very fast uh, train connection, about one and a half hours, but you're very dependent on that one train. So um, if you don't, uh, if that train doesn't exist for any reason during that day, you, um, your travel extends to around seven hours. And uh, so we just want to give more options while traveling and also to kind of uh, scale that down then to different scales so that we um, always create also for smaller cities different choices uh, how to get to places. Um, I just need to check a few ah, here. So basically, you could describe our concept of these uh, different sketches. We have the current situation here, where oftentimes um, you have to go back and forth uh, between two different uh, cities. So what we want to do there to be more efficient to connect uh, a more logical them in a more logical way, but also connecting them in a way that you always have, as I said, two directions to go. And uh, we did that with the creation of triangles. So we took an example from uh, a team sport from from football, where you always need two players to be available at any point 
to um, pass to. And uh, that also then enables us to kind of go away from the car mobility because I think a main point why people choose the car nowadays is the flexibility to go uh, whenever they want. Um, but yeah, we, we really hope to, to change that. So um, for that, we focused on, a, um, as I said, MEGA regional network. We try to work with the existing lines, but we are also adding some new high-speed uh, railway systems um, in different areas. Also connecting not only the big cities, but including the smaller cities. And then we also focused a lot on the network of, let's say, regional trains, um, because we saw a huge opportunity in them um, to really extend them uh, and uh, to really give these options. So when we, of course, do that, um, we, and we create a spotless network. We also want to unify it under one system. So for the tickets, uh, so we have one ticket, one app. And uh, for that, we want to join. That would also be the first step in our timeline to join all the different stakeholders. Uh, for example, the, the German railway, um, the Belgian railway, and the, and the Dutch railway system um, under one big stakeholder to begin the development. And then, uh, yeah, we further go on by first using what we have, uh, um, existing train tracks, and then maybe add in the future uh, some more. And maybe to make it more clear, we had um, this one example. So we took three different locations. We took Rotterdam, um, Wuppertal, and Mol, which is a very small city in Belgium. And just to give you an example how it is now, so the train connection between Mall and Wuppertal would take around six hours and you have to go to Antwerp and uh, Brussels first and to Cologne and then finally to Wuppertal. While, um, yeah, of course, it would be more logical to kind of directly go either to Eindhoven or Hasselt uh, and then further down to Wuppertal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Short and clear presentation. So I, I would like to suggest that we go to the next uh, group. Let me see. Yes. That That's would seven. be. 11. Go. Yeah, uh, team 11, please. I will share my screen. Um, Eric, is it okay if I interrupt with one? Yes, please. Question? Sorry. I think it was mainly for the last team, but uh, um, I, for all the participants, I think what Rupert asked, it was really interesting that how are you convincing the stakeholders mm -hmm. to join your project? So in a long-term thinking, why should they finance your project or why should they be a part of your project? Probably that's an answer you should try to give already in the presentation. So I would like to hear it from the previous team, but we do it in the interaction time, but maybe for others. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so welcome to our project 2D Delta, a grid of uniqueness. Uh, so we started with the city of Duren, as you can see here on this small location. Uh, next to Duren, it currently looks like this. So um, one of those cities is Duren, and next to it you have a really big coal quarry. And um, so it looks like this, really big. Um, and our idea is to make this uh, coal quarry into a touristic area, because one of the challenges of Duren the coal uh, quarry is gonna um, close soon because it has to close because of uh, sustainable and renewable energy. And because of that, a lot of people are getting in, unemployed in this area. So we have to, yeah, we want to provide them with um, like new, new jobs. So that's why we um, want to create 
uh, a touristic area of the location. So we want to create um, something like this. This is just visualization. Uh, so a large park um, with a lot of facilities uh, and things to do in the area. And then I'll give the mic to Mose and then he can, ex uh, no, to Parisa and she can explain a bit more about this map. Yeah. Uh, so Dugan is between Köln and Aachen, which is very well connected to these uh, two cities in Germany. And by uh, it is it is very close to Rhenish mining area. And uh, we um, predict that by uh, proposing uh, touristic uh, uh, activities and uh, turn transforming these two uh, mining areas to touristic spots. Uh, some changes will happen in Dugan. For example, Dugan will expand um, as a, and uh, maybe some services uh, will be needed in Dugan. Uh, we can expand along the railways, the, the major railways, uh, especially uh, those spots that are not uh, um, occupied by, uh, by forests. Uh, there are already some uh, batches of uh, residentials exist. So uh, this uh, light purple uh, defines that our prediction for um, maybe future housings and uh, uh, everyday uh, living services. And actually along with uh, the other um, railway between two coal mining area, we expect that uh, some services uh, for tourists uh, can be developed such as hotels, restaurants, and uh, other related. Uh, also, um, we are uh, proposing to uh, expanding our uh, existing railways. Uh, part of it already exists, and part, uh, part of it uh, we expose um, that uh, can be extended through the coal mining area and serve as a, a tourist uh, specified railway for tourists to uh, go through these. Um, and the previous uh, serving uh, mining areas that are, uh, we are expecting that in the uh, future will be turned to uh, green areas, lakes, and uh, so on. Yeah. And in the next right. step, uh, maybe we are uh, thinking about how we can um, uh, connect uh, or uh, upscale and this idea. Moses, can you explain? So finally, we have taken our idea to a broader uh, scale, that of uh, Eurodelta, where uh, we imagine uh, a grid of uh, unique, uh, unique uh, tourist centralities, uh, which we have categorized according to whether they follow urban practices, uh, such as uh, historical architecture or uh, artistic exhibition or recreation, or uh, uh, natural uh, practices, uh, such as uh, preservation park, uh, sport, uh, education. So we have defined uh, systems of uh, centralities with uh, bubbles that uh, exchange uh, uh, among them. And uh, the final uh, result is uh, to read Delta a grid of uh, uniqueness. Thank you for attention. Yeah, so this is our concept as final. Uh like a grid of unique places to visit to create um, a better Turi Delta. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Team 11. Um, we have a few minutes for some first questions. Um, so maybe maybe one or two remarks from the, from the members of the jury. Maybe Rupert or Marie. Daniel, David. Yeah. Please. Yes. Yes, please. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and there are uh, several projects uh, dealing with the transportation issue. And uh, if I understood well, uh, you dealt, the different teams dealt mainly with the uh, person's transportation. Uh, I didn't see um, elements, or maybe uh, uh, it was too quick. I didn't see elements about goods transportation, uh, which is a, a, a big challenge with uh, all the logistic questions. So I think what, what you were presenting could uh, certainly uh, 
a plan also to to good transportation and you know when when you do uh, traveler's transportation you also can transport goods so i would be happy to hear different teams on this uh, issue yes any of the teams would like to reflect on that it was just wasn't a big issue in the groups could also be the answer something to be under investigation for an, another <laughs> next 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 generation podium could also be the answer of course but yeah. it, it it struck me as well yes and for I, us for example we choose a location that already has quite a good connection uh because it's close to a railway so for us we were we were thinking that can be an example for other locations as well so if this works and it will attract people there and create more jobs, then maybe other uh, cities can also follow this. Mm -hmm. And other cities will see this ex as an example. Okay. And and then the question of, of cooperation, like um, uh, every team presented something that is cross-border. Do you have any ideas about how the cooperation between governments, regional governments, local governments could could be organized or is that not really big issue? Well, for our team, for team seven, um, we have this kind of network uh, concept. We propose um, the creation of, a, of some sort of uh, international institute, uh, Institute for Transportation, um, that would function as a kind of umbrella organization to um, work on um, uh, or to connect all the smaller parties. So all the, for instance, the national uh, train companies, so as Deutsche Bahn or NS, um, and also, but not only trains, but also smaller uh, companies working with transportation, such as Arifa or Connection, or, well, in Germany and Belgium, the Netherlands, there are many different um, companies uh, and, and also governmental organizations um, doing that, but to align them and also ensure the implementation of a single system uh, that works with all the modes of transportation and um, in all countries. And, and your team was a, a team of this just mobility of choice, yes. to act, yes. extra connections in the network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. Other other reflections on that from the members of the groups. Ideas on stakeholder management or. How do you get things working? Robert, please. Robert, your, your microphone is off. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just said um, uh, just one thought when, when I read in uh, this team two that uh, in 2025, the construction of the first dune begins. Uh, I think it's great to have a timeline, but uh, what, um, what came to my mind is um, is it realistic or do we need an, an, let's say, ethical or highly normative discourse also when, when I think of endangered species? In Germany, if you make some a bigger project and you see there one bat, then it will be stopped, this project, for, for several years. Um, climate change will come, yes, and also a rising sea level. So there is, it's really a danger for, for the regions and the societies. So do we have to put less emphasis, for example, on the protection of these endangered species? Or what about these, we can make it more general, um, the winners and the losers of, of new processes? Do we, uh, this would be a, a, an interesting discourse, which uh, um, well, very different uh, views uh, clash together. Thank you. Okay, maybe ideas from the, the team. Uh, the presenter, there was the, the magic June concept, wasn't it? Mm. Yes. Please. Oh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, well, I would say uh, that it's it might be realistic because we already have uh, examples to learn from and to um, employ good uh, results, good practices. So, if it would be just a very new idea, very innovative and new. Uh, then maybe it would take more time, but like this, I think the pro process could be um, speed up somehow. But of course, um, it depends always on the site uh, where the project is to be realized, because uh, we developed our idea more as of a, a project model. 
like a very flexible open structure. So of course, for each uh, site, there should be, it would uh, look differently also the timeline because it depends on the conditions of the site. Uh, but in regard to um, nature preservation, and we think that this kind of structures, because they are a combination of um, nature-based solutions and uh, um, engineerical solutions and gray infrastructure. So we also think that it's very important they combine uh, these functions and that they don't take uh, the, if they take some amount of natural uh, spaces, they also uh, give back some benefits in the same way or similarly, or even increase the, the biodiversity or uh, natural habitats, giving space for new natural habitats or extend them or connect them. Um, so it really depends on the sites uh, chosen for the project. But maybe we have some, some general thoughts uh, I think that the dilemma that Rupert raises is if we are really in a hurry, we could we could be confronted with the dilemma that maybe on some respects we should loosen the regulations, for instance, on endangered species. Could be any other dilemma as well. Um, is that is that something that has been discussed? Just in general, not not just necessarily the the endangered species, but regulations in general. Because they, they, they present also the, the danger of a big showstopper of, of, of these large scale concepts. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something to be discussed. We would really need a, a more experts in the group and mm -hmm. more research into this regard. But okay. also be necessary to do this cross border because if yeah. in one country the regulations were very strict and on another country they were quite loose and you have a very imbalanced situation. Okay, so I, I suggest if there are any, not any other extra questions, David, David, maybe from you, no, one or two remarks, or shall we go to the next set? What yeah, I can, uh, I can just say like, I, I really liked the brand of the Magic Dune. So, I mean, I, I memorized it already. I also think that the way you put all of these like it was not just a dune it was like it's indeed a magic dune it does all kinds of things and kind of mm -hmm. everything is possible um and it's not only a protection it's also it, it's form of leisure it is really a, a great contribution to the people of ostend but it's it's true that indeed the timeline it's it's kind of interesting with the the more pressing the the, the climate change becomes and and the urgency with uh, decisions need to be made because my question would be like how would you i mean it, the general exercise here is indeed feels like more like a speculative uh, scenario building exercise rather than i mean you you couldn't go to the site to really do uh, research and 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 feel the space and understand uh, the culture the people but would you would you consider involving the people of ostend in uh, the creation and the, the conceptualization of, of uh, the magic dike. Maybe don't I? I can you, should I answer if yeah. somebody else from the group wants to? Yeah, definitely. Um, we also put in our stakeholder map, which is also very <laughs> briefly um, that, uh, of course, the process would involve also the local stakeholders. Uh, from the business or um, sector, private, uh, public, but also local inhabitants into a participatory design, depending on the functions, which would be, I mean, the functions would be decided then together uh, at the municipal and national level. So it's a big process. Yeah, and I would like to add also, uh, because as we have already, we have also got a uh, the, the magic dune we consider it also like a public space so it's obviously important to involve uh, local people in that process uh, at, at the end of the day they're going to be the ones that use those public sp spaces therefore uh, the those spaces should meet their needs okay good good so my suggestion then is we're strict on time it's a little miracle as well uh, to start with the, the last set of presentations, and we will be seeing four presentations, as a matter of fact, uh, team three, eight, 12, and four. 
So maybe the, the student who wants to, uh, to present uh, team three, start the presentation. Yes, I can try. Um, it's my first time presenting on an iPad, so uh, I hope. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, and can I you can hear see me? It. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, sadly, you can't see me though because uh, it's the same device and uh, that's techn technolo technology. But um, yeah, my group was part of the water management and climate adaptation group, and uh, we concentrated on the future of food production in, in this group and uh, agriculture as a main driver for that. So we did a little brainstorm and we looked at uh, the main drivers of climate change um, and 25% of, of the greenhouse gas emissions come actually from agriculture and land use. And um, then we looked further into, into more details and we found out that the Netherlands use 65% of their land for agriculture. It's uh, staggering numbers in Belgium too. And um, the water consumption is also really, really high uh, regarding agriculture and production of food. Um, so from there, uh, we did a bit more research. Uh, we, we found this planetary diet um, that is uh, kind of suggesting a diet for the future that uh, complies with the boundaries of the earth, how we have it with the resources. So it's on the very right of this graph, you can see that the greenhouse gas emissions, they have to be reduced radically um, and most of it is is in uh, in livestock uh, production, and uh, yeah, from that we went into actually the impact of that diet and how it has uh, what has to change in the future to actually um, apply it. So the it's a lot of uh, colors, but uh, in general the food demand is going up. Um, and we have to deal with the CO2 emissions. We have to, we have to deal with um, agroforestry, so a change of agriculture in the, syst in the system. We have to deal with the water usage. Um, we have to also think about alternative foods when we are reducing the livestock foods. And um, of course, all of this can't happen without densification or intensification of agriculture in general. So from there, we jumped into, into a small scale um, kind of spatial idea of how this can proceed over time. Um, and it's just a, an idea sketch of uh, in a timeline where you can see that um, we are using the mobility corridors um, to make agriculture even more efficient, um, freeing up the land that uh, by, by intensifying agriculture around the mobility so that we have the possibility on the, light, uh, on the left and the right um, to use it otherwise for CO2 capturing or for water purification methods. And you can see it processing over time, growing. And uh, yeah, this is just uh, some references uh, how it could look like. And then this is kind of an, a bird eye view on this uh, small scale intervention, just showing that the whole process um, of agriculture should be um, combined and densified as much as possible. So from growing the plants to processing them, to packaging them and sending them, um, if you put all of that in one place, um, everything gets more efficient and less um, emissions will be emitted. Uh, we were also thinking about uh, using a lot of the, the places that we free up for, again, water purification and greenification. Um, and um, then we went into a bigger scale, thinking about uh, where to apply this. Uh, we've, we found this region um, between the Netherlands and Belgium that is quite heavily stacked with agriculture. So all the white spots you see on this map are actually used for agriculture right now, which is a lot. Um, and from there, we kind of embrace the, the mobility corridors 
as I already mentioned, and you can see that um, by intensifying agriculture, by rethinking agriculture, we can actually introduce a lot more green that will help with climate adaptation and water management a lot uh, in the future. So this is kind of the upscale that we, uh, that we did. And of course, this can also be thought around the whole Euro Delta. And um, yeah, it's kind, of, it's, a, it's a kind of a drastic concept, but uh, it just shows, we just want to show that if it's not changed now in the future, it even has to be, it has to be even more drastic because uh, yeah, agriculture is one of the, if not the main, fact, uh, main driver in climate change and to adapt to climate and to, to um, really manage the water efficiently, we have to think about agriculture. We have to bring the stakeholders together on that topic and uh, think about solutions that are future-proof. So yeah, I think that's, and in, in, I try to be very short. I hope I, I was in time, but that was kind of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, what shall we do? Shall and now we you can see me too. <laughs> yes, here you are. Thank you very much. So let's let's move on to the next uh, presentation. We have four presentations, so we are kind of hurrying up. Um, the next team, eight. which is team eight, please. Yeah, I, I can share my screen. So um, our project is called the Euro Delta Port Cities Innovation Network. So um, we're focused on two things. One of them is the an intangible network of uh, in a similar innovative uh, big port cities in the North Sea, uh, including London, Antwerp, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and uh, Hamburg. Uh, we propose like a, a cooperation or network between these innovative cities to come together to find solutions, uh, common solutions against common problems they face, including uh, pollution brought by uh, CO2 by ships, vessels coming into the ports, as well as the transport of goods inland by trucks uh, and road transport. These are all common issues that they face, especially in the three biggest ones, uh, Rotterdam, uh, Hamburg, and Antwerp. The pollution levels are really high. Uh, and also, uh, to reduce traffic on the roads in these cities as well on, on a local scale that would solve some traffic problems. Uh, so that is the intangible future uh, long term plan to establish this network the exchange of ideas exchange of in, uh, knowledge and innovation. Uh, in the Euro Delta region and then another more physical and direct intervention, we can do is to improve the connection. Uh, inland from Antwerp uh, and Rotterdam uh, through railways because uh, part of the pollution caused is also by heavy convoys and trucks moving goods and uh, from these ports into the hinterland of Europe. So we propose a more uh, sustainable and more environmentally friendly uh, railway networks that can move this, uh, these shipments faster into Central Europe and also Eastern Europe. Uh, choose Antwerp because it's the most uh, inland port in, in Europe and, and a lot of uh, cargo goes through this area and there's the shorter distance between the port and the hinterland of Europe. Uh, we found that the, there are routes to Germany uh, and, into, and then into the rest of Central Europe, but they are not, there are problems of bottlenecking and also uh, not very many border points. So we propose, uh, because Antwerp going to Aachen, uh, the closest border has to pass through Maastricht in, 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 the, in the south of the Netherlands. Um, we propose for nations, especially the Netherlands and Belgium to uh, have an op open borders policy when it comes to transporting goods uh, into the rest of Europe. So we can uh, reduce the amount of traffic on the road and we reduce the need for trucks uh, who, who produce uh, carbon and also carbon dioxide into the air and uh, ease the process of passing through borders 
from the Belgium to the Netherlands and then into Germany. And another route we propose of uh, expanding the borders or reopening new border points is uh, the, the rail yeah, the rail from Rotterdam, the port of Rotterdam to Duisburg. It's another way of uh, moving goods from the ports to um, the hinterland of Europe. Um, and then of course in the future through this network of uh, similar cities, similar sizes, similar functions, uh, we hope to hold like conferences or just events, talks where uh, the intellectual members of these cities come together to exchange uh, innovative ideas to, as time passes on, to cr create more sustainable ways of managing a port, uh, of uh, managing cargo, managing passengers, and uh, moving movement of goods from around the world into Europe or outside of Europe. So we can depend less on, uh, you know, old, old uh, ships and vessels and also on uh, managing the traffic on the sea because there's another problem with uh, busy ports is that there's a long wait time for barges and uh, ships coming in uh, and uh, the port does not have the capacity to, to manage all the, the containers and all the goods coming into it. So local port authorities in the short term can come up with policies such as uh, equaling the number of containers coming in and also moving uh, goods out, out of the port to allow ample spaces and to reduce the wait time for ships uh, making the movement fluid and to reduce uh, congestion of the, of, the, of the port and the, of the movement of goods allowing uh, uh, containers and deliveries to move quicker. Uh, and uh, for that is the gist of our proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a question? There was one uh, uh, question. Yeah, we, have a, we have a collage of it as far as uh, Okay, that's good. Ah, uh, London, there we go. Okay, there was, there was a question by uh, Marie. Um, if why a port like Dunkirk wasn't included in the in your research um, only we were, Rotterdam Amsterdam and uh, Antwerp yeah we were focusing mainly on the on the huge ports uh, ah. in the North Sea which sorry uh, Ma, just to uh, thank you Eric and Hoy mm. thank you just to make things clear it was kind of a joke but I ah. I, I was a little <laughs> bit sad as a French person and European person, to see London was included and not Dunkirk or Lourdes. Ah, okay, okay, Although okay. that was my, that was like a little bit like a private joke, but uh, hmm. well, we are in Europe and uh, it's sure that uh, French harbors are not that high, but uh, maybe at least Le Havre. Yeah, yeah. But in the in the future, for for in the future of our uh, this proposed innovation hub, one of the one of the proposals along the timeline is to integrate more ports uh, and to take in new members to expand, uh, to allow all these ports to grow equally develop on a, on, a, on, a, on a similar scale going on the same direction. Yeah. Okay, so I, I suggest we go quickly forward uh, with team 12. Carla has something quick to say, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, thanks, Malavika was kind of uh, ask, whoops, asking me to, um, to intervene or to comment. Um, and I like your comment on Dunkirk because we've worked quite a bit on Dunkirk. But it's also a question, who do these ports deliver to? So Dunkirk, its relationship to Paris, for example, or Havre and Paris. So one of the questions I was uh, maybe, I'm, I'm throwing in right now before the final comments, how do we balance attempts at circularity and improved connectivity and more mobility. So this last project was really talking about global circula circulation of, of goods, etc. So there are underlying questions of what do we want to achieve? Do we want to have more things floating around or not? Or if should we be limiting them? So the ports as this hub of entry to this territory which way do we actually see them grow 
And so I'm, I'm going to leave it as a, as a question. Maybe it's a point for discussion. Okay, maybe, maybe something to, to get back to when we have the, the, the final panel debate. Yeah, interesting observation. Um, how about team 12? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Shweta and uh, I'll be sharing the screen. Okay, I... Uh, okay, uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thank, uh, I wanna thank, uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity. It was really great working together. So um, yeah, so the topic that we are trying to address here is a cross-border platform for urban mining. So uh, before uh, we get into the topic, uh, oh yeah, so uh, cities are the minds uh, of uh, future. So this was uh, said by Jane Jacobs, but uh, cities are also one of the main contributors to environmental pollution, energy consumption, and also uh, primary material demand. And uh, in terms of cities, buildings are an integral part of cities and they account for more than one third of world's resource consumption. So uh, it becomes very important uh, uh, to consider all these uh, environmental issues. And uh, so one of the resource centric approach uh, uh, that could displace all the conventional practices in construction sector is uh, what we feel is urban mining. So a little bit about urban mining. So urban mining um, basically is the process of recovering materials and elements from uh, used buildings or infrastructure or landfills or waste, perceiving them as uh, uh, the building, uh, perceiving the whole building stock as a unified system. and uh, 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 like after a life cycle assessment of uh, these uh, materials, uh, uh, recycling them, uh, uh, upscaling them, and then uh, uh, storing them in material banks and which can then be used for uh, new projects. So this is like a, a, a quick brief about what exactly urban mining is. So uh, what we are trying to do here is basically the concept is to transcend borders. So uh, our idea is to create a circle economy for uh, borders through the concept of urban mining. So uh, after the life cycle assessment that I told before, uh, the recovered material can be upscaled and uh, it can be recycled as a new raw material for new projects. So um, uh, uh, there are very few cities that uh, right now have uh, urban mining initiatives. So this is a little sketch of uh, showing the concept about how, uh, for example, a country A has a city which already has an urban mining uh, uh, initiative. But then uh, uh, the, the transport of uh, the mined material from here, uh, 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 just inside the country, but then you know, regulating trade between countries. So this can actually uh, uh, like consume less energy in terms of transportation uh, than uh, within the country too. So, so these are some of the things that can be considered. And uh, yes. Okay, so then this is just a brief look at how we kind of thought about it. So um, obviously urban mining as a concept exists already, but then once you go into, once you see how much urban mining, how many urban mining possibilities there are across the Euro Delta region, we started thinking about perhaps doing this cross-border urban mining that could be aided through government structures within the Euro Delta region that incentivize not individuals, rather organizations or institutions to make use of this network. Um, and by incentivizing use of the network or such an integrative use of the network, you also kind of strengthen the public perception of the Euro Delta region as a unit. Um, so that's not just something conceptual um, and out there. Next one. Cool. So this is basically what we conceptualized. Um, it all gets together, comes together at a website. But what you can do is you have a bunch of towns that identify materials that could be extracted um, so whether it is in the classical sense of using building materials um, from decommissioned buildings or maybe de decommissioned mines when we look at places like the Rheinische Svavir um, you have those towns that have their materials they store it in a certain base and then you can the base can be a parking lot or a warehouse um, and from there it can be transported to um, other cities in the Eurodelta region um, through existing infrastructure as well, because we're now trying to reinvent the wheel. So existing infrastructure, such as um, waterways and railways, can then be used to transport this across the region. And the website basically 
which is the main thing, act as a database, as an inventory where the cities across the region can upload or document um, the materials that they have available and then other cities in the region can see that and then buy it from them. It's like a marketplace for used materials. Next one. Um, so this is basically just a look at what it would be or could be. So we looked specifically in our project at Amsterdam, Brussels, uh, Amsterdam, Leuven, and uh, the Rheinisches Revier. Um, but it could also add Brussels because it's a big city right there. Um, and you could start identifying like key or strategic cities within the region um, to be part of this. So basically the website is the, the integrating part um, and it acts as an e-commerce, it's almost like an eBay. Um, as an e-commerce site for used materials there is one or two kind of shortcomings though is you the euro delta cross or covers a large area so transporting goods will obviously be expensive if you say take it from france to the other side of germany um so that would need to be clarified also the kind of amount or the weight of the freight would need to be clarified and then advantage would be annual savings stemming from um, urban mining initiatives. And you can promote the cross-border trade and you can overcome resource limitation because Europe is rich in resources, but not necessarily within one specific area. So it's a shared kind of system. And then this is how we thought about it. So these we identified Leof in Rheinisches Revier and Amsterdam as our key um, cities. So Rheinisches Revier, for example, is known for the mining and the decommissioned mines will soon become a problem. Amsterdam is more known for kind of building materials like metal or bricks. And Leuven is known for um, timber. So if these kind of materials could be shipped or, or trained across Europe and then each kind of additional city would their specific product that they specialize in would be determined by the characteristics of the region that they serve. And that's the idea. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I think there were a few questions before for certain teams, like convincing the stakeholders. I think uh, uh, to answer that, uh, uh, some of the key points that can convince the stakeholders is the, the collaboration that, that they can have between these cities and, and, and the with the benefits that they get in terms of uh, environmental sustainability or uh, how, is, how is it economically beneficial. And also uh, like uh, we uh, addressed, uh, it's, it helps tackle resource limitation too. And uh, one of uh, the other things that we need to consider is the mobility, that the transport of these goods. And uh, I think uh, uh, there are there were a lot of pitches about connecting ports today, uh, uh, it, especially the one with blue corridor to inter interconnected network. I think all of this can uh, uh, can be a base uh, for our particular pitch. So uh, yeah, so yeah. Basically, we're not trying to design anything new. We're just trying to facilitate collaboration and yeah. integrative or integrated yeah. systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there, there's a question, maybe you can answer it straight away. What kind of mining in the Rheinische uh, Revier? So we're very known for our brown coal mines. Uh -huh. um, and soon, because of trying to be carbon neutral, um, by 2038, those will be out of service. <laughs> OK, good. OK, uh, we're, we're still within our timetable. So if there's no urgent question not from the jury, I suggest we go to the last presentation, team four. Yes, I'm going to present. <clears throat> Should I share my screen? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, OK, we are the last team and hope there's still some energy left uh, for our presentation. Uh, our project is called, uh, proposal is called Follow the Moss, and we are basically following the Moss River path, and we think uh, the river offers a spatial conditions that could uh, host so many different collaborations and create uh, many networks that goes uh, transnational between uh, Netherlands, Belgium, and France. And uh, sorry, the, Puria, could you make it full screen? Oh, uh, yeah. Is it better? Yes. Perfect. Uh, that's perfect. And uh, to answer Rupert's question, I think uh, if I was in the charge of this project and I wanted to market uh, this uh, 
um, this uh, design, I would uh, call the municipalities of all these cities and say that, okay, we are using this river as a mere canal. And this project it could offer you um, a vision that how can we use it as a natural expressway. And uh, yeah, and for uh, inspiration, we had this map that it's the historical map of uh, Mississippi River in 1941. And it kind of depicts uh, all the historical traces of the river through different times and different uh, historical period, all combined in one picture. And I think it clearly shows this dynamic uh, nature, this dynamic power that it is in the nature and we lose this power through our uh, like last century developments. And we kind of, um, we are proposing that this uh, potential should be rediscovered and utilized again. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we thought that um, we, actually we started other way around and we focus on the mega scale rather than local scale. And we thought that, okay, if we have this uh, sample of a uh, region along Moss River that is mostly uh, blocked by agricultural lands and industrial lands and some uh, urban fabrics going on along the river, uh, these, all these uh, human-made uh, pattern, human-made spaces are disconnecting our green clusters, our natural, natural forests. And our first um, step to revitalize this nature is to connect them again. So we thought of the idea of relocating these agricultural lands as the team three elaborated, uh, the new, the future diets and the new modes of agri production, agri food production especially, uh, could give us this advantage to remove arable lands that are uh, polluting the water, that are polluting the nature, and kind of implement new ways uh, of agriculture uh, like agroforestry, which in long term will be transformed into the natural forests. And then we have these zones of, uh, uh, we can say, agglomeration of uh, agriculture, industry, and urban in certain areas. And then the nature freely um, um, evolves and expands uh, beyond and above it. The next step in our project was identifying uh, the different challenges we had and adjusting them according to the sustainable development goals. Uh, for this reason, uh, we use this framework that uh, categorized the sustainable development goals in three main levels of biosphere, society, and economy, and taking biosphere as the basis um, uh, as the basis of the any uh, future development that we are gonna have, and everything then will be built upon that. So. If we make this categorization, you can see that we have different uh, strategies and actions implemented for each of them. And some of them could be spatial, some of them are organizational, some of them are educational. And we think a clear and efficient uh, approach should address all these different layers into one coherent picture so that it would be both applicable uh, to different situations and also flexible enough for the future. And then we took this uh, toolkit that we made and applied it on the map. So we made a grid upon Moss River path and we said that, okay, if we have these different sets of micro strategies, uh, we could implement them differently according to the needs of uh, different parts of the mass. And even though we are not suggesting one uh, unified uh, design approach to the whole uh, river, uh, in the end, uh, we have this kind of uh, pixelated strategies going along the river that could um, 
in, in practice better answer to the challenges that uh, this or the opportunities that is uh, going along the river. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priya. Uh, and I think uh, you, you started by uh, asking if anyone, anyone had enough energy to, uh, to give the proper attention to you as uh, the final uh, speaker. But I, I think you did brilliantly. And the, the, the pictures I saw it in the chat were um, very convincing. So exactly at half past four, we are at the end of the, the, the presentations. Um, First of all, of course, compliments to all the teams because you managed to do the presentation within the time schedule. So we have plenty of time to discuss what we've seen. Um, I'm, I'm delighted by, uh, by all the results. Uh, the jury should know that uh, students had only very limited time, only a day, day and a half. Uh, they had some introduction in, in a variety of, of uh, uh, ideas relating to these these three uh, issues: climate change, cross-border mobility, and, and uh, smart specialization. Um, and then they had to apply that into uh, a only short period of time to to come up with this kind of strategic visionary ideas. Of course, uh, uh, in real life, this this would require a, a months, maybe years of work to bring it to, to something that, that could be implemented. But uh, I think it's, it's already um, very, very well uh, done in terms of out of the box thinking and, and finding new connections uh, between lots of, uh, of, uh, of issues. Um, so maybe just to start, any, any members of the jury would like to reflect on the, the whole of this kind of kaleidoscopic image of all these ideas but first first reactions how, how does this feel is this are these some some ideas that we could use to bring um this euro delta idea a little further anyone or carola if you if you'd like to participate wonderful feel welcome yeah, i have plenty to say but i think the others want to respond first and i can yeah. summarize david or, um... how, how about you Yes, I, I'm, um, I'm super excited, actually, because the thing is that I, I'm in this team and we're working on um, just shortly from the, the side of the Nor European Bauhaus, and uh, we're, we're working on a, on a tool which we now call the Compass, and this we will uh, launch and announce in, in a week when the New European Bauhaus Festival takes place in, in Brussels. You should all come. It's from the 9th to the 12th of June, and there's a lot more of these kind of conversations and talks. Uh, and there we are trying to actually um, just like the sustainable development goals try to create a tool that gives can give direction to a, a project and we start from the three value um, the three main values we work with in the new european bows which is sustainability inclusion and um, quality of experience beauty and now we're trying to break them down and eventually to to come to very concrete actions tied to those um to those values to yeah be able to say okay but what does it mean to be inclusive what does it mean to be sustainable and i think you i've, I've seen many um very strategic because of course that was the the exercise for this weekend but the main pressing question for me and for the all of the teams would be like what would be the first step you take to set this project that you've just pitched to us in motion um and it's it's more of an overall question that that i because i love to see all of the strategic thinking but i'm just like what would be this first step and i think poria already gave some kind of answer in the last presentation as like i would just call up um all of those municipalities and trying to convince them of the of the mass region and and I think also with his cool visuals, he would actually be able to, to get somewhere. Um, yes, that, that was just the first comment. I'm not sure if, if uh, we should like the rest of, um, like we did previously, we should give some comments on specific projects in the last batch. No, I, I, I would buy my suggestion, or? but um, feel free to, to uh, contradict me. 
uh, but to have uh, some, some general ideas. So what I take from you, uh, David, is your announcement, I think, is very important for everyone to know uh, of the, uh, the introduction of the Compass uh, for the, the new European Bauhaus and, for, yes. and then the depressing question to all of the teams, what would be your first move? What would be your first step to get things in motion? So let's let's stick to that that one and see if the other members of the jury have uh, an, an equal kind of pressing question, and then we we give the teams the opportunity to answer. So maybe Rupert, your yeah. you have some sort of pressing question to all of the teams. Uh, okay, for, first of all, uh, congratulations to you all. Um, I'm very overwhelmed of your ideas. Uh, this, it gives me also much inspir inspiration, and also. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, to you for for promoting this this session. This is, uh, I think, very very inspiring, and uh, that thank you, you so much are devoted to this. Very great. Um, you just said uh, this uh, thinking out of the box. Yes, uh, this should be also expected from from younger people, and uh, great. And um, I'm a little bit thinking about um, post growth. Um, Carola mentioned it also a little bit with this uh, with this uh, circular economy, which is an aspect of, of post growth. Um, but maybe uh, your question is: Is your basic assumption um, still growth, um, more transport, more containers? Um, well, in this um, uh, how you call it urban mining project, it was uh, what was less the aspect. But um, I would like to know whether. Mm -hmm. Growth or post growth is uh, this aspect. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tempting. And and Marie, one one urgent question to all of the teams. <laughs> Thank you. First, joining my colleagues and uh, yourself, Eric and Paul, for uh, congratulating all the teams. It's uh, it's really impressive and intriguing. In how can you do such uh, professional things in such uh, short of time? So congratulations. And I was especially marveled by the illustrations. Some illustrations make us dream and they are very, very uh, powerful. So bravo, vraiment bravo. Uh, I, I would like to, mm, mm, several different teams mentioned and I think rightly so that the the, the questions uh, uh, of stakeholders and governance, which is obviously in uh, real life to say so a major issue. And as Rupert said, uh, with time passing, things can change and how do you manage the whole project and all this. Also, we, we clearly see, and that was in the, in the, the, the what you had to, to deal with, the different scales. So the different level of territories. And uh, my questions of remark would be how to, according to you with your new vision, uh, succeed for having what we could call competition. Because we know, for instance, if we think of harbors, of ports, we know there is a very hard, extremely hard competition between ports. Uh, not only between countries, but even be, uh, inside a, a same country, we, we, we know the, the, the market forces and all this. So how do you, can we, as far as economy is concerned, how can we both deal with competitiveness, but also with cooperation? So to have a com competition, which obviously is the only way to, to reach the SDGs. Thank you very much. That for me is a new word, co-competition or co competition, co which is a neologism for co competition plus and cooperation because right. you have to do both, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Clear, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, my, my suggestion to the teams is either you you put some answers or, or remarks uh, as a reaction to the questions in the chat box, or you raise your hand. And I I thought I saw. Puria's first hand. Just, uh, yes, answering the question of Marie and also David, I think uh, also always uh, introducing common interest uh, as uh, is the first step and the best way to overcome this over -competi competitiveness that is going between different zones and ports and 
if we can make introduce certain forms of economies that is both uh, like profitable for both parties or more or uh, and also be right now considering our time requirements be um, ecological friendly then that's a win-win for everyone okay any other team would like to reflect i also thought this this question of are you conscious of the the assumption on growth or post growth was that part of the of the work you've done were you explicit about that or does do you do you really think that we should use or stimulate growth a little more in order to get to this post growth situation wendy or maybe yeah, an, another question the first step question for instance no, I, was actually, I wanted to reflect on uh, Rupert's question on uh, post uh, growth or growth. Um, it was a theme that we didn't really discuss, but I think underlying was rather not post growth, maybe, but post consumerism in a sense, in that um, I think our team went from the idea that in the future it will be challenging enough to actually have enough. Um, and this is why we wanted to raise sort of that food question and consider agriculture as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that it, it might be more about sort of a change in, in behavior as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Siska, how about you? So um, I think I'll answer the growth question first and then the first step question. Mm -hmm. um, I think so inherent, like for us, we never really discussed um, whether or not it's a growth thing, but so inherent in, inherent in urban mining is um, that you don't make new things. Like the point is obviously to reuse what you have. And so throughout the process, we discussed um, things like using the existing railway system and like using what is there. But so often you have so many resources in this world, but it's the problem of getting it from point A to point B or for point B knowing that that resource exists in that point A. And so that's kind of, we just want to basically make it easier to collaborate and, and, and kind of um, integrate systems. And then in terms of the first step, um, I think it's, it's all about like lending credibility to, some, to, to a system. Um, so first steps for me or how I'm thinking about it would be identifying say three or four partner cities that are very strategically located. So along a big port area at a, a large railway connection, something like that, having these four cities across the Euro Delta um, region buy into your idea, log some things on your database and then showing them as an example of best practice um, so that other cities can then say, oh, we also want to be part of this network. Let's sign up, let's also share resources. But it's quite a slow process at the start, I think, to show that this actually does work and then after say a year, maybe two or three more cities will sign up and so it'll grow. And I think it has to be kind of an organic growth thing. Other, other reflections on this? Yes, Wida? Uh, yeah, so uh, in to continue what Siske was telling, like I think uh, identifying these, uh, uh, like in addition to what she said, uh, identifying the cities that already have taken urban mining initiatives, not necessarily in the name of urban mining, they might be recycling uh, materials. So identifying these cities which already have these practices existing and then uh, 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 and one of the things that we talked about the website, the website is a kind of like collaborative thing, which redirects to the country websites too. So uh, I think this might be the first step to have like a database of cities, which already have these best practices and then, uh, uh, you know, making uh, uh, an system out of it. So. Okay, I, I understand that because urban mining is, is not something completely new, which in fact, it's very old, uh, but we have forgotten to work with it for a, couple of decades and it's it's already in, in many places it's something uh, indeed on on different names but yeah we, we could so we we, we are looking at us at the situation where we try to something that is already growing um speeding up and scaling up towards an a true economic uh, uh valid power yeah 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 other uh, members of the teams to reflect on these three three questions of the of the jury the, the first step what's your first move 
how do you how do you think about growth and 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 the end of growth and uh, how do you <clears throat> ensure cooperation cooperation this new word uh, Niklas, just please a comment uh, yes uh, sorry I, sorry um i think that um, all of these three questions can kind of be combined into the big one, because if, if we look at them um, as single questions, they, for me, they all kind, kind of lead to the same answer, which is um, we can't have the same growth uh, economically as we are experiencing in the last decades, because that's just not sustainable. So we kind of have to trim the growth into... Um, not actually growing, but but using what is there more efficiently, and um, we have to take this. Uh, we have to create this efficiency by um, creating um, smart networks. So that's the, already the second question. Um, we have to become more efficient by by um, using the technology we have by creating these networks, so that the resources. Uh, that are limited um, and therefore the growth that is limited um, we are using it all more efficiently and we are growing through that so using the same resources or even less but becoming more efficient in using it is actually the growth i think we should aim for and um, that's also answering the third uh, question with the uh, with the first step is um, i think just showing stakeholders the huge potential that is there um, to to col collaborate means actually to profit from both sides it's it's not stealing from each other but it ex it's actually uh yeah supporting each other and and growing through efficiency so yeah i think uh, all of these three questions together um can be summed up in one answer <laughs> But it's not only a question of efficiency, it's also a question of sufficiency. Uh, this was mentioned also by, uh, I think it was uh, Wendy, I don't, uh, I don't see it in, in, at the moment, um, this change of behavior. And this is on a very individual level. This um, consumption, strawberries in winter, apples from New Zealand, every year new mobile phone and, and all this, uh, which is uh, resource demanding. And we as a regional developer, we always, this is the, um, the race between the rabbit and the hedgehog. We always are um, behind and the industry driven demand and also people driven demand is also heading away, speeding away. and. Um, we have to we think, oh, how can we change our spatial structure to um, ensure this this uh, this kind of lifestyle? This is a very um, pressing question also. Yeah, it's uh, sorry, just to add one one thing, it, this is exactly uh, why we we uh, um, in our group, in my group, uh, we focus so much on the future diet because it's actually, it is not a choice, but we have to do it. So uh, we have to find uh, maybe if it if it's not. Uh, we had a huge discussion in the group about um, if it is possible in a bottom up or a top down approach um, to to implement the change in behavior. And uh, in the end, it's it's kind of a mix as always. Uh, it's really difficult to pinpoint um, where to start uh, exactly. But um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it has to be done. So <laughs> it has to come from both sides, yeah. Yeah, S sounds like a paradigm shift to me, but maybe uh, I think Leah, you were a little already, wait, already waiting with your hand, and then we go to Said. please. Hello, uh, thank you so much for the presentations. I'm actually not part of any group, uh, but I just wanted to, contribute to this discussion, because um, I think that's a really crucial part. And I was thinking exactly, um, or I have to agree with Nicholas on that all those three questions are totally interconnected. Um, and actually I was thinking since I heard uh, the group of agriculture and production, um, that was the first time when uh, this came into my mind that uh, we also have to think about 
what do we expect and what shall we expect? Um, for example, the way how we do our agriculture, um, is it efficient or is it sufficient? Um, because, uh, for example, there is a study from the, uh, what is it called, AgroParis uh, Tech and INRA about per permaculture. Permaculture, is that the right term? Mm -hmm. um, which says that permaculture, 1,000 square kilometer of permaculture, are more uh, efficient than one hectare of uh, conventional agriculture and stuff like that, you know? So that's just an example for, um, we need to rethink how we, produce we need to re rethink our economy system because um, it's based on the interests of very few very powerful um, people or groups and uh, that what leads me to the approach so where will your first step be um, I, I always have this discussion and no matter what topic it is if it's production if it's um, participation if it's democratization we always come back to the thing we need le legitimate um, policies. So people need to understand what is going on. Otherwise we have a problem in democracy. Otherwise we have a problem with people supporting the EU and stuff like that. We have a problem with collaboration. So um, that's how I shift to the theme education. We need uh, to uh, so badly to invest in our education in order to emancipate people that they do think they have the that they have the power to think about sustainability and their behavior that they take responsibility that they themselves um, change their landscape their communities um, and take a stand. I'm sorry, it's a very broad theme, but I uh, like in discussions like this, I always realize how everything is interconnected. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a bit overwhelming. But on the other hand, it's really empowering because I think it's in the end, it comes, oh, well, at least I want to believe this, <laughs> it comes down to this individual who thinks not of him or herself, but uh, for, for a group. And um, this is what we need to base everything on <laughs> mm -hmm. um, makes thank you, you makes, much. yeah thank you thank you leah that, that makes me feel very optimistic actually although we face huge huge problems i i when i uh, that's that's my uh, conclusion of today there are many ways <laughs> to uh, to get over pessimism and to get things done uh Said, please hi uh, so again first of all thank you jury for your comments and uh, just in uh, to add what uh, we had already explained in a presentation, I'd like to say like uh, uh, we actually uh, as a team believe that uh, Euro Delta itself uh, is something like most of the cities. It's a growing organism. It will never stop growing, and the needs will change, and the demands will change, and so will the stakeholders who will come to contribute to those needs and uh, demands. So uh, it's very important to understand that. Uh, uh, at, at least we believe that giving extremely long-term uh, goals uh, is not really a best way of dealing with it because uh, over the time, the technologies, the needs and the nature of everything will change. So it's better to rather face things in certain certain ways so that there can always be an addition of a new idea and which can further be carried out to uh, continue the process. So uh, for example, uh, uh, we propose certain uh, uh, system of uh, commuting systems, but uh, we also be understand that uh, the same technologies cannot be functioning after 30 years or 40 years because cities are growing and they have different growth patterns. So maybe we rather utilize these existing uh, systems, identify which are the weak spots, aid them with new technologies, and then also propose slight introduction of new technology so that it's also not a shock for the users because users are not very adaptive to uh, very sudden new technologies as well so it's a it's a process that you have to introduce people a bit by a bit in order to get accustomed to a new system and then proceed further yep yeah. yeah. okay we, we go to paul and then i would like to uh... Here is something from the jury again. 
Paul, please. Yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, if you allow, of course. Uh, Eric, yes, of course. Uh, of course. For me to intervene a little bit, because I want to emphasize also a, a point which I think is really important, which was shown in, in most of the work. So I think conceptually it's very strong, but I also very much like the redrawing of the Euro Delta. Eh? So the finding other structures, finding other uh, um, border denying structures basically within the Euro Delta. So I, I really would like to emphasize that part. I think that's really an important first step if we talk about first steps is really to find with each other structures that are maybe hidden or need to emerge out of new ways of looking at, uh, at things that, that really can help us uh, within the, the Euro Delta. So I really like this concept of the mass or the, the concept of the agriculture mega structures is really super inspiring for me so i i would like to um sort of advise all of the teams to highlight that bit if we want to bring this uh, to the festival to the european Bauhaus festival it's it's really the idea which is uh, is is uh, is very important but also the spatial structure that uh, that you uh, sort of uncover and uh, that can have us relook at the, the Euro Delta. So I think that's um, really exciting for me to uh, to find new uh, new structures there. I just uh, wanted to highlight that point. Yeah, I, I completely, completely agree with that. It, we're in a way we're sort of rediscovering or redefining or reinventing words and structures that probably are already there, but suddenly come up as important once you uh, stop thinking in countries and borders and mm. start thinking in people and transitions and and the the, the big challenges that that we're facing so um we have a few minutes left i i would like to get back to the jury with uh, two questions for each one of you uh, one is is there one specific project that you would like to uh, comment on and the second is do you have some uh, advice for maybe a group of projects that uh, where they could um, develop even further or so that's that's a, a comment and a, an advice that I would like to ask from you maybe I'm over asking Alan Krita has also uh, raised a hand Do you have ah, sorry comments? I didn't see that Anakita please no I it's okay. I was just adding on to the positive optimism that uh, Eric, you also mentioned, Paul also mentioned, because it's also, I think, good for the jury to know that the participants were very much struggling or questioning yesterday when they started the project that how can we impact such a big mega region? Like what, how can we do that? You know, they were feeling very overwhelmed with the question of impact. But I would just uh, want to say that applauses to all the teams because what you suggested is actually bringing a lot of positivity and impact and even just questioning the right putting up the right questions that's already the first step ahead so that's what i think each team did and uh, like I, I think it's really uh, creating much more impact than you can even understand so that's all thank you all right i see a hand from carola well, well, yes, I was getting also very excited and triggered here, and I did take some notes. So if you like me, uh, I could start sharing them now, and then we can come back to other questions and comments okay. from the, from okay, the jury. Okay, if everyone side. agrees, yeah. Um, okay. Unless somebody had some urgent uh, remark first, but I, I'll share my screen briefly, and then maybe uh, perhaps this uh, this can help bring bring things together. So what I try to do is throughout our, our conversation to understand what key points were. And you were just asking, so what are the main takeaway points? So that's, uh, that's also where I, where I started uh, trying to put it together. But first, I wanted to really at least briefly give some praise here for this whole event, because as last year, it is always a fabulous event. Excellent presentations. Congratulations to all of you. It shows the power of visualization, the relevance of spatial thinking. And I think it's really a highlighting the opportunities of collaboration between practice and academia and all of that in across borders, which is even more important. And the, the key points that uh, you were just asking about, I tried to take some of these down. It's probably way too dense, but I didn't have time for highlighting. 
But what these shows, I think we need system thinking. And whether it's in the port projects and collaboration between ports, collaboration, coordination between cities, or just thinking of water systems, all of this speaks to this more system thinking idea. And this system thinking links directly to connectivities. So we saw projects for rivers, we saw projects for the flows of ideas between universities, between education, uh, or between uh, collaboration on tourism, for example. We did see a bit on livability, for example, in the food project. We, sit, we did not see as much, I think, on jobs of the future. We talked a bit about new lifestyles, but that could be one way even to go further to think where and how will we be working in the future and how will that change? Um, maybe I'm not going to look at all of them. You can, you can read them. Uh, we talked a bit, and also I saw it right now in the chat, about participatory practices. So how can we engage with diverse populations, particularly if the not everybody is a trained planner and may or may not understand what we are, what we are discussing. Uh, the question of temporalities. So what time frames are we actually talking about? How long is a politician elected? How long are students studying? How much time did we had to work on a project right now? And how much time would it actually take to realize such a project. I think that's another theme that we could be thinking about further. The other thing that I tried to take down um, while we were talking is questions of dualities, because I think there's also um, no, conflicting or potentially conflicting topics. And we heard when we talked about new mobilities, uh, connectivity, yes. Well, on the one hand, we're all for connectivity, but as we are shipping goods, we might be going against ideas of circularity. When we talk about cross-border collaboration, particularly in this very historic area, we're also potentially endangering local identities. We didn't talk about question about different languages. Do we want to preserve them or not? Um, we are talking about new lifestyles, but we also have a historic built environment. And maybe that is one of the questions that I saw missing. We have all these practices out there. We should acknowledge them, even the heritage buildings, perhaps in more extensive ways. We start, we talk about climate change, sea level rise, but we seem to keep the economic patterns. Will they actually stay if everything else changes? So this famous question of will the Dutch move to, the, to Germany? Maybe we need to rethink those, those foundations. I uh, really like the idea of starting with the mass, for example. So we could think, rethink everything along watersheds, but that might be in opposition to if we think about city links. And these ideas of what can we do in terms of natural preservation versus food um, generation. So any of these practices can be opposing each other, which is why it is even more important to rethink them as a integrated system. And I forget whether it was uh, Paul or Eric or someone, one of you who mentioned uh, a similar idea. The question of technology is also an important one. I mean, many of us work at a technological university, for example, but it can also be about changing practices. So once we start living, working differently, maybe we do not need technology. And that gets me to the point, so what maybe have we been missing in this discussion? So this whole idea of guiding values or ethics, we just came up with the growth, post-growth paradigm. For example, someone mentioned non-human actors. So maybe we need a discussion on how we as East Western European democratic nations with goals of inclusivity, sustainability, et cetera, how do we want to live and what does that mean on a larger level? And in that, what is the role of local identities? I mean, particularly when you're talking about the German French border or the, the German Luxembourg border or even uh, Belgium, Netherlands, etc. You do have a lot already in the ground in the practices, including, say, dissonant heritage. So those heritage that people will be competing over, even the Atlantic wall, as far as I know, um, the preservation is done in the country, so in the Netherlands, for example, 
and German uh, specialists who and were among the ones who built this heritage in the beginning cannot participate. So there are even historic conflicts that we still have to, to overcome. How do we overcome these, these silos? And in the field of spatial planning, I really do think that we need to talk about questions of land ownership, of planning law, of planning tools, and ways actually to make change happen also through lifestyles. There's also this question from growth to shrinkage. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of shrinking cities. Do we preview um, some of these ideas also for the future? Or do we not care of them, which gets me back to this guiding idea of values and ethics. Um, I have one more, um, one or two more takeaway thoughts here, and I can just share them first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing, and then we can come back to the discussion. But I think we might also want to discuss what the takeaway points are for education and practice. So you could even ask people on the screen. So how would you like this to be done in the next round? Because there has to be a next round. It's just so fabulous. Um, and what are the forms, teaching, uh, engagement that we can uh, imagine for the future? And I do think that, uh, and Puria, I just uh, took a screenshot of this proposal. The thinking it through the SDGs is very important because that allows us to speak a shared language. Doing it along a watershed is brilliant. And I have to say, I'm gonna show you my version of this, which I'm currently working about. I do think the SDGs are part of a sustainable system. And so what I'm just trying to figure out now is how could we integrate biosphere, water culture into individual and collective SDGs and what are actually the actions we can take while using the SDGs to promote a more sustainable future. So taking the SDGs and maybe even asking each of the projects to rethink their approaches, the key themes that you were just asking about through the lens of the SDGs might make it even more communicable, uh, including for a more general public. So that was a small intervention on, on, on some takeaway points. And I thought, let's leave a bit more time for others to, to come back on this and uh, discuss further. And maybe the, the, the jury has other, or Paul and Alan Krita, Eric, have other ideas. Well, I, I'm just astonished. I, how do you do that? <laughs> we have a discussion with 80 participants, 80. <laughs> uh three sets of presentations uh eight groups 12 groups how do you do that you're, you're just working while everyone is speaking that's, that's fabulous okay um i i would like to uh because we're, we're 80 with 80 people in this is this is um chat we, we can't have everyone um reflecting on this but i i would like to give the last word to the jury that's what juries are for so um, how, how do you feel about the summarize, uh, summary of by, uh, by Carola? Who the jury could, uh, maybe, maybe Rupert? Yeah, okay, uh, thank you. Um, I have to digest it. It is <laughs> very much food for thought. And I think it is the, the essence of, of our um, uh, discussion. Um, I would really like to continue this discussion with you. This is, um, um, it is not, not the end. It is a really a starting point, start, very good starting point, and which is um, also um, important for, for all of us in, in the different countries. And we saw also um, today this uh, um, cooperation networking, cross-border European aspects were dominated this. And this makes me also really, really happy. I, I grew up in, in uh, southwestern uh, Germany. I could see the French mountains from, from, from the village I came up. My, my, my parents had uh, friends in, in France and Switzerland. So I grew up in this uh, cross-border thing and really makes me happy that this European idea of growing together is so much really incorporated in your, in your thoughts and uh, in, your, in your visions. Um, I cannot really, at the moment, I cannot um, um, 
say something about one project. Uh, but I, I propose, um, or I, I promise, um, I will write it down. I have uh, many um, uh, notes taken. Um, I will, some aspects are already already said. I will send it to you, um, Eric, and you could distribute it to all the other participants. Would make me happy. And um, there are some some questions. There are some annotations. Um, um, but it is so inspiring, and uh, it would be really a pity if we we stop the discussion uh, and do not continue with this. Okay. Wonderful. And this is also uh, one last aspect. It is uh, this Euro Delta is uh, something um, which um, yeah cries for this cooperation on the one side to let's say to the to the west it is the, these global connections um to the east or to more to the south it is the european hinterland um so it is this this hub function but it is also a region in itself but uh, if uh, it is always regarded also these other aspects transport of course everything what flows um, is um, of course uh, is, is needed to to uh, be um, handled in a, in a cross border or European wide or even global um, or let's say supra regional um, way. Um, I think this is uh, in, in this region it becomes really um, it is very it is so much stress this this idea yeah, of flows. Thank you, thank you, uh, Marie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Eric, you suggested uh, messages to to the the different teams. Much has been said. I agree with. I would say that uh, keep going this way. I think you have a you know very on a very useful uh, track, all of you. And uh, keep in mind, but you already have it. I think keep in mind the importance of uh, taking into account the different dimensions of public policy and of, uh, of public policies and of SDGs, as uh, Carola and other colleagues were saying. So, the, the 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 necessity of a systemic approach, even if you can specialize or focus on one or dim dimension, but always have them in your background, and then obviously the 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 necessity of uh, the different scales from local to global. And uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. So, David, from you, the last word from the jury. <laughs> Where are you? Already gone, no? Ah, <laughs> no here no, you go. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you are. Please. Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I think this, the corporate laptops of the commission, they don't like, they don't even have Zoom. So it, I need to find out. Anyway, I just wanted to show my, my notes that like it's how messy they are because it, that happens when your brain is like trying mm -hmm. to make all of the connections in the, and yeah, I love how always at the end you, um, you end up in such discussion really at the core fundamental questions and we really start um, question, questioning ethics and yeah I there's two things that I that I know that also I mean we at the New European Bows now are trying to to deal with is in how how to live together really um, and in in the discussion I heard Leah saying also like okay but how can we speak to um, the common man and speak to the people outside this whole planning community and this is one of one of the big challenges of course um, which we're now trying to with the work of the compass really try to break down and try to tell the stories from the perspective of someone who experiences something because if you if I look at like the urban mining um, project it's I know I know the people from Atelier Circulaire, and I've also worked with the people from Rotor. So I'm I'm envisioning those people, and I know who they are, and I know how they've worked. So I, my my point of view is completely different on that project. So generally, I found like the the, the people were a, a bit missing in some projects. Also, in Niklas is um, so like who are the people who are going to do that work, um, and who are the people involved in all of these kind of practices. Um, and that's a bit the whole story of the of the new European bios and why 
we have to try to make the green deal a little bit tangible as we want to bring that perspective of inclusion of the people in inside the green deal because now it's very much focused on sustainability but it always has a soft impact somewhere else and um yeah so that's one of the one of the big challenges so indeed i agree also on this having a frame what carola ended with uh, and this idea of like trying to to hang up your project to something that a bunch of people a lot of stakeholders have collectively thought about and agreed upon um, and this is also a bit the work we are trying to do now and yes that's if indeed systems thinking i um and the, the idea of the, the redrawing the borders what paul was saying i mean now more than ever the geopolitical situation the bo borders are incredibly defining they really like a human is what a border is um so all of that loads of loads to process loads to discuss uh, thank you very much to for having me it was it was wonderful and i'm a, a bit sad that i can't like meet now and and have mm -hmm. i don't know a drink and discuss with you that that would be that's, brilliant that's reality we we, we we keep that yes. on the agenda that uh, will be the, the next next generation podium maybe an opportunity at the festival at yes the festival. that would be right yes we'll see each other in, in brussels so it's exactly 60 minutes past five i think uh we should come to a ending of this wonderful week and this wonderful session uh first of all I that there's something I really have to do. I would like to thank, of course, the members of the jury uh, for their reflections and uh, simply by asking questions, by by giving attention to what the students did was already a great uh, push forwards. And then uh, the comments helped, I think, everyone very much to to put things into perspective. Big thanks also to Carola for wrapping up, uh, for reflecting on things and um, then uh, I would like to say thank you to the universities, uh, the, the, the participants, uh, the participating students come from 13 different universities across the Euro Delta and beyond. But that's, that's already uh, putting into practice what we preach. So we, we really want this cooperation. And um, I think thanks to the, the universities to, to make this happen. Thanks to the, their teachers. Most of all, thank, thank you to the students who were uh, willing to, to uh, uh, put themselves under pressure in delivering in, in a, a day, day and a half time, uh, very, very interesting, ins inspiring uh, pro uh, proposals. But last but not least, thank you very much to the people behind the scenes. Uh, I, I felt very flattered when somebody said, I'm a founding father of one of the founding fathers of this Euro Delta idea and, um, <laughs> Uh, maybe true, maybe not. I, I'm not sure. I feel part of an of a movement that says only can be uh, can only grow because of there are many people behind the scenes working on it. Special thanks to uh, Emma, Malavika, uh, uh, Anakita, and Cecilia who uh, did a lot of work, uh, great work to make this happen. And I think um, I I can uh, only uh, promise that we will make sure that we. Uh, do this next gener generation podium uh, at least one more time in the near future. Thank you all very much uh, and have a nice weekend. Can we have See a quick picture with everyone okay. on switch everyone on their videos? Put on the, the video. Yeah. Can we all get down? Yes. I see everybody coming in. Just one minute and I take a screenshot. Smile. <laughs> uh yes thank you so much and rupert i'm going to steal your statement and the report will be named on euro delta cries for cooperation <laughs> thank you thank you all thank you very much so big applause to everyone yes thank you very much great event thank you uh -huh. okay bye bye then <laughs>